Good afternoon, and welcome to the uh, Cancer Research Prevention and uh, Treatment uh, Session. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you, and also like to welcome those that are watching remotely uh, this webinar. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to uh, view this uh, informative uh, session uh, concerning uh, cancer and the research prevention and uh, advanced treatment. <clears throat> As we all know, the last, uh, really the last five, seven years, there's been the, the, the cancer risk reduction methods and, and, the, and, and cancer exposure has been really a fire service priority. Uh, and over the years, really since 2010, uh, the research has really picked up. We've had a lot of research uh, on, this, on the fire environment, but not only on the fire environment, but how that fire environment affects the firefighter. <clears throat> Again, there's been a lot of discussion on the preventive methods uh, that are out there wearing the SCB overhaul, bagging the gear, washing the PPE, uh, storing the PPE in an isolated area at the fire station, not dragging it through the station. Uh, your station wear, washing your station wear, uh, immediately not, not wearing station wear after a structure fire throughout the fire station. And we'll get into the reasons why. And that's one of the goals here is to understand the methods that are out there, why we recommend them, and why the fire service is pushing them. And we also know there's been research on those preventive methods. We want to know if the effectiveness of those methods really work. So our goal today is, is, is that you take away, you have a better understanding of why changes are being made in the fire service and the effectiveness of those changes. Additionally, we'll talk about cancer treatment because the cancer treatment continues to advance in leaps and bounds. So besides myself, again, I'm Larry Pichek. I'm Deputy Director of Occupational Health and Safety Department within the within the IFF. Our other speakers are Dr. Kenneth Fenth from NIOSH and Dr. William Flood from Nantelth. <clears throat> As you know, we all have the IFF Fallen Firefighter Memorial. And that memorial is there to honor those that have died in the line of duty. And really, we're the only organization that accepts and, un and, and respects those that have died from occupational diseases, including cancer. And our goal in the future is hopefully never to put another name on that wall in any, in any line of duty death. But most importantly, we really want to stop occupational diseases and hopefully no names in future generations uh, will have to put their name on that wall. <clears throat> when we look at our statistics, these are the statistics from January 2017 to December 2017. So the names going on the wall uh, this year, 74% of those names have died on line of duty from occupational cancer. Now those numbers in, have, have in, increased this year, and the reason being for that is that the last two, three years, we've had more states add presumptive laws within their statutes. So the, so the number, the names, more names are being added to the wall due to the occupational cancer. But when you look at it over a 15 year span, really we're averaging 63% of the names on the wall are from occupational cancer. Now that most certainly sticks out and that's most certainly an item that, that really reflects why we're doing the research and why we're trying to understand how this happens, why this is happening to us. <clears throat> now to, what's the IFF doing about this? First of all, we had, a, we had a firefighter cancer summit in San Francisco in October of 2016. And what we did is, is we reviewed the research, what was done, what does that research tell us? What is ongoing and what do we expect from it? You know, what else do we need to know going forward concerning uh, firefighter cancers? And what else can be done for our firefighters? And this summit included IFF leadership, physicians, researchers, epidemiologists, and, and, and firefighters from uh, large departments that have already done or been, or have been part of research, such as San Francisco, you know, Chicago, Philadelphia. <clears throat> and what we did is, is, and out of that came, what we're going to hear from Dr. Flood, is the, is the advanced treatment on cancer. Because what the general president wanted to do is he wanted a better understanding, not only of what's going on, but he wanted to know what can we do out of the box to help our firefighters with treatment that's beyond the normal care. What can we do? We have to be in front of this. And that's, and that's what the summit produced. And also, out of that summit, you know, we have a summit later this week, you know, for all the firefighters of the IFF to, 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 to educate them to what's going on. The Firefighter Cancer Registry Act 
Right now, it's, it's uh, House Bill 931. It passed, uh, it passed the House and is currently in the Senate. It's in the Health, Education, uh, Labor, and Pension Committee. You know, our goal is to have this cancer registry. It's to establish a specialized registry for firefighters at NIOSH. And the idea is to consolidate and gather epidemiological information. And with this information, our public health researchers can take a look at, take a look at the actually true numbers of firefighters that may have, have, that have cancer throughout the United States. And it also will improve our understanding of the, besides the overall incidence, but what time the treatment is being conducted and how advanced that cancer is, along with the amount of exposure time. What are some of the exposures and the length of exposure? So our, the goal is future generations down the road, they can take a look at this information and come up with, uh, again, more solutions, um, a better to you know, use this information for improving turnout gear, improving technology to protect ourselves even a bit further. <clears throat> a firefighting, firefighter exposure tracking. One of the issues we, uh, we have, and, and Dr. Fent will, will explain uh, later on, is that yes, we know we're exposed to this harsh environment, but what's not known is how does that exposure impact us? What's the length of the exposure? What's the time of the exposure? How much of the exposure? You know, what exactly of the, of the exposures that we're exposed to is impacting the human body? So in order to do that, you have to have an exposure, you know, we want to create an exposure tracking method. Now, there are some out in the field. You know, California has a, a system. There's some other systems up in the Washington State area, uh, some other private ones. But through a, through a grant and through um, the IFF, we developed an exposure module within the Enforce system. Now, the Enforce project is the National Fire Operations Reporting System. And, and what, what this system was created for, uh, to hopefully replace NIFRS at, at some point, but it accurately reflects what is happening operation-wise on the fire ground. And then, it questions, and then the questions in the data uh, that is entered is pertinent not only to the member, but to the researchers. So it, again, it's to replace NIFRS and really get into the data of what's going on, how long an engine's been on the scene, how long it's actually attacked the fire, how long it uh, was in rehab, and then the exposure model module for our firefighters in there uh, those, like I said, those questions were put together. We just didn't want a data bank of questions. It was questions that were analyzed that the, uh, you know, the, the researchers said, these are the questions that we can use. But at the same time, you know, we'd have a number of questions that our members can use, especially if it's going filing for workers' comp or for uh, pension cases. So that module, again, is within the N4 system, which is available uh, uh, for fire departments, and there are a, lot, a number of fire departments that are using the n uh, model. Matter of fact, there's uh, the one booth out there. We do have some information on Enforce on the uh, fire uh, EMS uh, booth. <laughs> Smoke research. <clears throat> Probably one of the one of the most interesting and really the first really strong research study that came out was put out uh, uh, by Underwriters Laboratory in 2010. And now, even though we've known in the past uh, that you know, obviously smoke is bad and that it has toxins and carcinogens, et cetera, in it, this report really broke down and identified the smoke particulate size. And really, it was really the first one, the first uh, research project that identified uh, findings associated with firefighter contamination. And it, overall, it did give us a better understanding of what's going on with the particulates. Now, as firefighters, we, we always think of smoke. Okay, smoke's there. Okay, we put an SCBA on, smoke's gone, take the SCB off, it's clear. But what this research has done has told us that here, there's something more that's going on. Clear air is not, uh, it's not really truly clear. There's been other studies that, that followed along this line. The Queensland study from Australia research, uh, Dr. Burgess's information uh, studies from overhaul uh, through the University of Arizona. Uh, the University of Cincinnati has done a lot of research. Uh, Boston, uh, Ottawa is the most, uh, most current that came out with research on how these particulates are impacting um, throughout the fire station, et cetera. UL, Underwriters Laboratory, NIST, and most currently the Illinois Fire Service Institute. But really, just to, just to touch base on a couple of the results from this study, <clears throat> and I'll just read them off, average, average particle sizes range from 0 0.04 to 0 0.15 microns. Now we're going to keep that number in your in your and remember that numbers as we go further through this uh, pr our presentations. 
For any given particle size, synthetic materials will generate approximately 12 and a half times more particles per mass of consumed material than wood. 99% of smoke particles collected during overhaul were less than one micron in diameter. Of those, 97% were too small to be, vi to be visible by the naked eye, suggesting that clean air is not really clean. Chemical composition of the smoke deposited and suit accumulated on firefighter gloves and hoods were virtually the same, except concentrations on the gloves were 100 times more greater than the hoods. So you can see what's going on. And finally, high levels of ultrafine particles, really less than one, one, one micron, were found both during suppression and overhaul phases. Now the thing to understand about these particles is we can't see them, but they exist, but they absorb. You know, they're absorbing the car carcinogens and other toxins out there, or they can adsorb, uh, attach themselves to those particles. <clears throat> Another research project was actually done by Dr. Fenter, and he'll, and he'll explain this further, was the evaluation of the dermal exposure to PAHs and benzene. And really, this, this started off as a health hazard evaluation, which went into a, an actual research project. And this is the one that's, that, that started off that, hey, something's happening to our exposures that is affecting the firefighter. These, these PHHs H's, and benzene are entering our body. And they took a look at, okay, why is this happening? And just reading just some highlights, highlights from that study, what they've done is they sampled P8, P, uh, the poly, <coughs> polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are the PAHs, <coughs> the volatile organic carp compounds, which are known as the VOCs. They collected breath and urine samples before and after each burn. Um, they took wipe samples of firefighter skin to measure PAH contamination before and after each burn. They, re they measured the VO VOCs uh, released from turnout gear, you know, to see if there is off-gassing. And, uh, <clears throat> and what they also is they tested the SCBA to make sure there was no flaws within the SCBA, the, the entire system, to determine that there was no intake of a contaminated air. And, and what they found is, you know, PAH air levels were obviously above occupational exposures. Um, some of the VOCs released from the firefighters' gear after the fire was, after the, res the response. Uh, the PAH levels on the firefighters' necks were higher right after the burns than before. The levels of benzene in the firefighters' breath were higher right after the burns than before. And then in the first round of their study, levels of the PAH, PAH breakdown products were higher in the urine. So uh, what this really came down to is that, that the PAHs are entering through the skin, you know, with the neck being the primary site of exposure and absorption due to the lower level of dermal protection provided by the hoods. <clears throat> and that was important because that's where we talk about the exposures, the amount of exposures that we have, the time, what we're exposed to is getting into our systems just by fighting a fire in that short amount of time. What else has been done with that is, is through that, after that study is we took a look, the IFF funded the fluorescent aerosol screening test, and I'm sure everyone has seen these pictures throughout magazines. Um, and other presentations. And what this showed here, because the Queensland, what they said in, in the Queensland research is it came out and said they found levels of contamination within their turnout gear and, and on, their, on their station wear. So they determined, well, how is that getting there? So you know when we're, we're within a fire, it is pressurized, you know, with the smoke. So what this FAST did is it measured, it, it, it did the same amount of, of pressure that you, you would have with the smoke within a structure. And we found a lot of weaknesses. Obviously, you can see the hood area, which we knew was the weakest because that's the dentist one layer um, of Nomex or PBI material. But we also noticed, obviously, the, 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 uh, uh, <clears throat> the connections at the front of the coat. It was the, the, the hip waist interface, the boot leg interface, and obviously the glove uh, cuff, cuff interface that we're still getting the smoke and the particulates onto our onto our skin, but also onto our station wear. So when we talk about not walking around the station after a fire, and we talked about the size of those particulates that are getting underneath within our gear, you can see as we're walking around the station, these particulates can be deposited throughout the station. So with that being said, we've conducted a fire station dust study. 
Now, the first study was actually done by the California uh, uh, Occupational Health. They did on 26 fire stations out in California, and they found, and it was based on, on what they were measuring were flame retardants, and they found out that there were high levels of flame retardants throughout these fire stations. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to get an understanding, you know, is this just uh, out there or is it common around the, around the nation? So there were five, five urban areas uh, uh, that were chosen uh, throughout the United States geographically different, and uh, out of those, there was five or six stations from each of those five areas, and dust was collected from the fire stations. And lo and behold, you know, all of the fire stations have higher levels of flame retardants in the dust uh, throughout their fire stations than you would see in a normal residence and when you would see in an, in an office building and other occupations. So we are dragging, you know, dust around. <clears throat> and, it, and by those studies, uh, it helps us identify and control sources and come up with the methods uh, to stop that spread. Now we're also conducting this study, right now it's being conducted in five cities throughout Canada. So we can see if we get the same measurements uh, up in Canada. What's interesting in Canada, you know, in, in the US fire stations, uh, we have a lot of carpeting. Uh, in the Canadian stations, they do not have a lot of carpeting. Uh, they have these solid floors. So it'll be interesting to see how much dust um, is in existence at, at, at those stations. <coughs> So in a 3,000-foot view, you know, what is cancer? It's really damaged DNA. It's abnormal cells. Something, something damaged that DNA, which causes the cells to divide without control. It's uncontrollable growth. And it spreads and invades other tissues. We have malignant, which is, which is not, not a cancer, benign, not a cancer, tumor cells that grow only locally. And then you also have malignant. That's where the cells grow, and then they spread throughout the body. Well, what causes it? It can be caused internally by genetic factors, or it could be caused by external factors, which is where we're more concerned about the external factors. Now, remembering the size of those of these of, of the particulates, you know, whether it gets absorbed or inhaled some way, you know, it gets into our system. Now it stays in that system and it may attach into a, onto a cell and it may stay there. Normally every day our bodies work hard to get rid of the toxins within our body. But as a firefighter, you know, and synergistically, a lot of those toxins may stay there, and it may cause the cancer. And it's probably showing that because we do know we have higher rates of cancer among firefighters in the United States. And we have a lot of different cancers, and cancers occurring at earlier ages. As we know, IR, the International Agency on Research on Cancer, uh, groups, groups uh, and identifies, classifies uh, uh, all your chemicals. Now, there are hundreds of thousands of chemicals in existence, and not every one of those chemi uh, chemicals actually has a classification because there's so many. But we're concerned about group one carcinogen carcinogens, which is that particular chemical is carcinogenic, carcinogenic, which is example like benzene, formaldehyde. Uh, group two, probably carcinogenic. Uh, th th they're showing that animal studies and some human studies will show that, yes, it has an impact on the human body. Uh, but they're not exactly, they can't exactly, there's not enough research to say it truly does cause cancer. Possibly carcinogenic and then not classifiable and probably not carcinogenic in hu humans. But, some, but they also identify some occupations. And now the occupation of firefighting is listed as possibly carcinogenic. Now the last time, the last time they, I, they, they uh, studied and discussed firefighting was in 2010. And part of the reason they, they listed as possibly is they said, yes, we know you're exposed to a lot of car, you know, carcinogens, um, but we're not quite sure on the general toxicity and how that exposure and how that exposure is affecting the human body. And that's where since 2010, there's been a tremendous amount of research uh, conducted uh, to show what was missing out of there. <clears throat> so hopefully when they reclassify that, we, we can move it up to probably or most, you know, or our job listed as carcinogenic, which would help obviously in the uh, presumptions uh, with the states that don't have presumptions, and even in the presumption state, the states that do have presumptions because our firefighters are still fighting hard to win those cases. <laughs> what do we see normally on the fire ground? You know, arsenic, asbestos, benzene, formaldehyde, all of these are, are a lot of, res of all the research, these are the common chemicals that come up. So you can see, fighting a normal structure fire, we're exposed to a lot of group 1A, group, group 1 carcinogens. <clears throat> now, if there's one takeaway from my presentation, it would be this picture. 
Now, when we talked about the particulate size, you can see exactly what we mean. So that long strand, the large strand going across the screen, is a hair. Around that hair was, is, is the blue, you can see the blue, the, the blue uh, circles. Those are particulate matter that's, that's uh, 10 microns. And if you put a ring around, those, around that, which would be the red towards the top, that's particulate matter that's approximately two point, you know, two and a half uh, microns. Now, what's that, if you remember the number what I said before, the ultrafine particles are less than one micron that we've, that's found throughout, throughout the uh, smoke uh, in the overhaul area. So you can't see it. You know, so like our panel here, it's even more invisible uh, because, <laughs> you know, our hair, we don't have hair to measure. <laughs> but the point being is, when we say that air is clear is not clear and is damaging, uh, while we wear SCBA, while we're careful taking off our gear, is because these particulates are so small that, that, <clears throat> that they are entering our bodies. And, take, and just taking a look at this slide, you can see where the particulate matter, how deep it can get into the lungs and into the body. Overall, when we talk about risk management and the hierarchy of, of controls, <clears throat> There's five, there's, really, there's five things. Elimination, can we eliminate our hazard? No, we cannot eliminate our hazard. Can we substitute it? No, because we fight fire and that's the products of combustion. Engineering controls, well yes, we can help isolate people from the hazard, we can set up SOPs. Administrative controls, same thing, creating SOPs or changing the way people work. And then the PPE, as you can see, the PPE is the least effective method, but that's our greatest protection is PPE. So that's why the, the culture, and we're saying we have to change the methods, the mythology of what we're doing on the fire ground to wear SCBA longer, to change the SOPs, to have cut teams, uh, cleanup teams that can come in and do overhaul after you know, other, uh, the crews that have been fighting the fire are already you know, exhausted and their, their gear is already contaminated and, <clears throat> and we have different crews coming in so, they, so they're, they're fresh. Because what's the first thing we want to do after a fire is take off that air pack. I just want to bring, uh, bring note that we do have a cancer awareness and prevention online course on our website. Uh, it, it goes a little further in, into detail what we just talked about. So please take the time uh, to take a look at that uh, cancer awareness and prevention course. Now mine was a 30,000 foot view um, of, of what's going on in the fire service and what we have been doing. But really, the, we talk about all the research that has been taking place, and, and Dr. Kenneth Fent uh, has been uh, really the, the foremost researcher uh, working on firefighter contamination and firefighter exposures. Dr. Kenneth Fent obtained his Master of Science and Doctoral Degrees in Environmental Sciences and Engineering from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He joined NIOSH in 2008, you know, where he currently works as a research industrial hygienist. He's also commander in the U.S. Public Health Service, where he is a member of the Rapid Deployment Team and has responded to numerous emergency events, including the Ebola response in West Africa. Uh, Dr. Fent's research um, has focused on assessing dermal and inhalation exposures to the combustion byproducts in firefighters. Uh, currently, he's involved in a comprehensive study of cardiovascular and carcinogenic risk during modern firefighting in collaboration with the Illinois Fire Service Institute and the UL Fire Safety Research Institute, and a prospective firefighter cancer cohort study in collaborations with the University of Arizona and the University of Miami. Uh, please welcome Dr. Kenneth Fent. Thank you. So I don't know what Larry's talking about. I'm not bald, I just choose <laughs> to keep my hair really short. Um, so it's really an honor to be here today, and like Larry said, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, the current research looking at cancer in the fire service, and then really focus on the carcinogenic exposures, which is my area of expertise. It's not advancing. Okay, so... For the outline for today's talk, I'll, I'll start with the, the cancer risk. So how does firefighting increase your risk of cancer? And then really look at the, the different ways that firefighters can be exposed on the fire ground, including breathing it in and absorbing 
the contaminants through the skin. We'll talk about recommendations for reducing exposures and then ongoing or and future research that we are involved in. So there were a number of studies that were done really with, within the last like 30 or 40 years going back, uh, which we would call the early studies of firefighters and cancer. And these studies did find increased risk of a number of specific types of cancer for firefighters. But the problem is these studies were relatively small studies. They were looking at firefighters in specific geographic locations. And one way to measure the, the size of a study or the, the power of an epi epidemiology study is person years at risk, or PYAR. And just to put this into perspective, these studies were, you know, or the NIOSH study that was done that I'm gonna talk about here in a little bit was anywhere between four and 20 times larger than these studies. And if you look at these early studies and you look at the standard mortality ratio for all cancers, so that's all cancers grouped together, some of these studies do find an increased risk. So the point estimates are shown in, with the blue dots. Anything larger than one means there's an increased risk of cancer. And then the error bars, if those error bars are larger than one, meaning the, the entire error bar is above one, then it's statistically significant. And most of these studies were not statistically significant, but part of the reason for that is that they were just too small. You didn't have enough power to actually detect a true difference. When you do an epidemiology study, you have to have a comparison group. So in a perfect world, we would have firefighters with exposure and compare them to firefighters without exposure. But obviously that's impossible to do. So what's done instead is we typically will compare firefighters to the general population. The problem with this approach is that firefighters, especially career firefighters, tend to be healthier than the general population. And so you get what's called a healthy worker effect. In essence, we would expect firefighters, because they're healthier, to have less risk for chronic diseases. And so you may not actually detect a difference simply because of this healthy worker effect. When you do an epidemiology study, it really comes down to the, the weight of evidence. You're trying to build evidence to, to say whether or not there is a true risk of cancer. And so there's really three things that you look at when you do epidemiology studies. And that's the strength of association. So do you see a really large relative risk? When we look at the early studies, the relative risks are small. You look at consistency. Do you see the same types of cancer elevated across all the different populations of firefighters? In those early, early studies, we don't see that. The, the relative risks vary by different types of cancer. And the other thing that you really want to see is a dose response. So firefighters with more exposure, you want to see that, that they have a higher risk of cancer. The problem with these early studies is that we have basically no exposure data, so you can't look at a dose-response relationship. So one way to kind of ad address these limitations is to do what's called a meta-analysis, and that's basically a way of combining all these small studies into one large group or cohort and look at the relative risks by cancer. And this was done by Dr. LeMasters at the University of Cincinnati back in 2006, and she found that there were four cancers that were probably associated with firefighting, and they were testicular cancer, multiple myeloma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and prostate cancer. So shortly after that LeMasters study in 2010, and, uh, and Larry mentioned this. IARC looked at the occupation of firefighting to determine whether uh, they could classify it as carcinogenic to humans. And this is unique because IARC usually looks at chemicals, sometimes classes of chemicals, oftentimes just specific chemicals. In this case, they looked at an occupation. And this is really challenging, especially with firefighters because you're all over the country, you're all over the world, your exposures might vary, the way you fight fires might vary. And as I mentioned, a lot of these early studies had limitations. They were too small, they might have found some cancers were elevated in one study that weren't in another. And so they ended up classifying 
firefighting as to be possibly carcinogenic to humans. So at, shortly after this, NIOSH decided to do a much larger study, basically a study to try to address a lot of these limitations. And so they looked at assembling a, a cohort of 30,000 firefighters. Again, this is the largest study to date that has been done. And they were fire, career firefighters from Chicago, Philadelphia, and San Francisco who were employed between 1950 and 2009. They looked at cancer mortality and cancer incidence. And this is imp important because the way cancer is treated has changed, survivability has changed, so it's, it's, impor it's as important to look at incidence as it is mortality. And then, of course, as I mentioned, you have to look at a comparison group, which was the general population. The other nice thing about this study is they also were able to look at trying to estimate what exposures firefighters had and then examine a dose-response relationship. And as I mentioned, so, you know, firefighters are presumably healthier than the general population. So if you look at the uh, death by all causes, we see no increased risk for firefighters. And so this would suggest that in, indeed, you know, the general population is a good comparison group or there is this healthy worker effect. If you look at COPD, which the primary cause of COPD in the United States is smoking, we actually see a reduced risk. So anything less than one is a reduced risk for firefighters. But if you look at all cancer, then we see there's an increased risk of about 14% from dying of all cancers. So what does a 14% increased risk of all cancer mortality mean? Well, unfortunately, cancer is a very common disease in the United States. And so there's about a 23% risk of dying from cancer in the United States. So if you look at this room right now, and you take 100 people, unfortunately, 23 on average will die of cancer. However, since you guys are all firefighters, there'll be three additional people who will die of cancer due to your occupation of firefighting, your exposures. So I don't want to diminish what that number means. Three out of 100 is still a lot of cancer. When you think there's one million firefighters in the United States, that could, be, that could add up to 30,000 firefighters who die of cancer due to firefighting. So the other cancers are due to other risk factors like diet and smoking and your you know, uh, exercise and those kind of things. So for the NIOSH study, they also looked at specific types of cancer. And they found that there were seven that were statistically significant shown by the red dots. And those were mesothelioma, rectum, oral cavity, esophagus, esophageal, intestine, kidney, and lung cancer. And the mesothelioma is important because the only known cause of mesothelioma is asbestos exposure. So this is known as an occupational cancer. So we can say with pretty good confidence that this is due to your occupation of firefighting. The NIOSH study was also able to look at risk differences by age. And so cancer typically affects older people. But if you look at uh, firefighters at younger age groups, so uh, in this case, 40, looking at prostate, 45 to 59, we see an increased risk of developing prostate cancer among younger firefighters. The same thing with bladder cancer. The NIOSH study was also able to look at women and minority groups. Now, women, there, there are not that many women firefighters in the United States, and so even though this was a very large cohort, the sample size for women is still pretty small. But you can see that there appears to be an increased risk of bladder cancer for female firefighters. We need to, as Larry mentioned, if we can do this uh, firefighter cancer registry, we can greatly increase our statistical power and maybe this is a true effect. Looking at minorities, we see an increased risk of prostate and leukemia among minority males. As I mentioned, we were also able to look at dose-response relationships. And this is really important. If you want to try to establish uh, you know, the weight of evidence for causality, 
you need to have a dose response, see a dose response. And so we did find that leukemia risk increased with fire runs and that lung cancer risk increased with time at fires. Okay, those are not perfect ways of estimating your exposure, as you all can imagine, because a lot of it depends on your assignment at the fire ground. And as Larry mentioned, that's one of the objectives of the N4's exposure tracking system. So how, did the NIOSH, how does the NIOSH cancer study compare with other recent poll studies? There have been really, in the last few years, there have been four pretty good large studies in other areas of the world. And as you can see, a lot of the cancers that were identified in the NIOSH study were, have been identified in these other studies, but none of the other studies found all the same cancers that NIOSH did. And there's one more study that I just want to mention. This was done in Australia. It's pretty recent. And they looked at cancer, uh, dose-response relationship for cancer risk for Australia firefighter trainers. And you can imagine, you guys, I'm sure, are well aware that if you are a trainer, an instructor, that your training fires may constitute the majority of your exposure. And what they found was firefighters in that high, that trainers in that high exposure group appear to have an increased risk of cancer compared to the, the lower exposure groups. So in conclusion, while all the studies, even going back to the early studies, had limitations, even the NIOSH study has limitations, most do report a link between firefighting and cancer, and certain types of cancer do appear to be consistently elevated between a number of the studies, especially the recent studies. A few studies have shown have demonstrated dose-response relationships. So that's important for weight of evidence. Now, the cancer risk from firefighting is small when you compare it to other risk factors, but that's not to diminish the importance of it. The, if it is due to your occupation, there may be ways to prevent those cancers, and a 3% risk does add up to a lot of cancers. And so that gets to that last point. Obviously, there's a, there are a number of things that can be done to reduce your cancer risk, including reducing exposure to carcinogens. Future cancer studies, you know, we do need to look more at women and minorities, rural departments, as well as wildland firefighters, volunteers. I would add fire arson investigators to this list. It's important to look at incidence and mortality because the survivability of cancer is changing. It's important to control for potential bias, like the healthy worker effect, as much as possible, as well as other risk factors, and to examine dose-response relationships with more reliable exposure estimates. But to do that, we need firefighters to track, firefighters and the fire departments to track exposures better than it's been done. So now I'm going to um, delve into the area that's really my area of expertise, and that is the exposures. So we've, we see that there is, appears to be an increased risk of cancer in firefighting. Why is that? So it's important to look at the entire pathway. So that includes the source, where the chemicals originate from, the composition, what exactly is in the smoke, how they contact the body, the intensity and duration, how they enter the body, the absorption route, and, but what's really most critical is the dose, how much is actually absorbed into the body. So it's, it's no secret that the structures today have a lot more synthetic materials than they used to have. And this includes polymers like foams and plastics, resins, surface coatings, as well as chemicals that are added to our, our furniture and other pieces like flame retardants, stain-resistant coatings, and plasticizers. Because of all these synthetic materials, modern structures burn much faster today than they did in the mid-20th century. And a good example of this is, a, is some work that UL did where they found that structures today can go to flash over in five minutes versus 30 minutes with a legacy structure. And with, because of all those synthetic materials, there are many more toxic combustion byproducts that are produced. So, if you look at the literature and some of the other materials that are coming out from IFF and others, you'll see some of these chemical class names, PAHs, VOCs, aldehydes, 
acid gases, and so on. And it's important to note that no matter if you burn anything, if you're at a campfire, you're going to produce some of these compounds. You're going to produce pHs and VOCs and aldehydes and acid gases. When you add the synthetic materials, you're going to produce a number of other chemicals like phthalates, for example, PBDEs, which is a type of flame retardant, dioxins and furans, organophosphate flame retardants, and then, of course, your apparatus run on diesel, right? So you also have diesel exhaust. And as you can see in the right column, that there are a number of potential health effects from these chemicals, but many of them are known human carcinogens. So how do these chemicals contact the body? Well, it's, it's, a rather complex, it's a rather complex process for firefighters. Obviously, when, these, when you burn something, it's going to be released into the air, some of it. It's going to change because of oxidation and other processes. It can then deposit onto surfaces, including your turnout gear. It can penetrate your turnout gear and get onto your skin. When you're taking your turnout gear off, it can transfer to your skin. If you're not wearing your SCBA and you're near the smoke, you can breathe it in. If you get it on your turnout gear and you get into your apparatus, what do you think can happen? It can then transfer to the apparatus and all the way back to your fire station. So it's not just the, the fire ground that we're worried about. It, it extends beyond that. So if we start with PP contamination, there have been a number of studies that have found PAHs, phthalates, flame retardants, metals, heavy metals, those have all been found on turnout gear. PAHs and flame retardants have also been measured on Nomex hoods. And we actually did a study that's uh, in review right now, the paper, and we looked at hoods that had been uh, worn for four fires and hoods that had been worn for four fires and laundered after each fire. And we found that the laundered hoods, although it clearly looks cleaner, right, that picture up there, that we still found that there was residual, residual contamination of things like flame retardants, brominated flame retardants, even after laundering. So we did a, a study, and actually those hoods comes from this study, um, with IFSI, where we had firefighters do a coordinated attack of a residential structure with modern furnishings. And every firefighter did four different responses. And we looked at the contamination of PPE with PAHs. And I know this is probably a little bit too small to see, but what we found was that uh, the contamination increased with successive fires, as you would expect. And then the contamination differed by position on the fire ground. So interior operations, firefighters who did attack and search had much higher contamination than firefighters who did overhaul. And then the exterior firefighters, incident commander, pump operator, they had uh, virtually no contamination on their turnout gear of, of PAHs. We also looked at uh, PPE off-gassing, and Larry mentioned this during his presentation. But one thing that we did that was unique is that we took six sets of gear that had been worn for a response and we put it in an enclosure about the same size as an apparatus cab. And we did that because, you know, that's potentially what you could be exposed to during the drive back to your fire station. And what we found is that indeed the, the levels of a variety of VOCs, including benzene, increased right after firefighting. So off, just the off-gassing of the contaminants were measured in the air inside this structure. We also did some uh, gross on-scene decon, and then we put them back in that, that uh, enclosure and did more air sampling, and the levels went kind of, you know, back down near ba sort of background levels. But what's interesting is whether we did gross on-scene decon or not, the levels, they came back down to near background levels, which tells us that a lot of these VOCs will off-gas just naturally over time. So even if you don't do gross on-scene decon, there may be an opportunity to just let your gear air out to remove those contaminants. Now, VOCs are volatile, so we would expect them to leave. I mean, that's what they do. That's why they're called volatile. We did not look at semi-volatile compounds, which may be much more persistent and will take longer to evaporate. So what about tracking contamination back to the station? 
Well, as Larry mentioned, there was this study done, and I need to update this because much of this material has been uh, published, but they looked at flame retardants and fire station dust, compared it to other occupational settings, and found that fire stations had higher levels of a number of the congeners, including brominated flame retardants and organophosphate flame retardants as a class. Now the intensity and duration, as you, as you know, firefighting typically is a pretty short process compared to an eight hour workday, for example. But the exposure levels are very, very high. And a good example of this is we've done measurements and other researchers have done measurements uh, for benzene inside the structure during a fire. We measured levels in excess of 40 parts per million. To put this into perspective, the NIOSH short-term exposure limit is one part per million. So this is 40 times higher. These are enormous concentrations. I've never seen concentrations this high in any other occupational environment. We also measured hydrogen cyanide during firefighting and found IDLH levels, not only inside the structure, but just outside the structure, for example, during outside ventilation. And this is important because perhaps firefighters aren't always the best about wearing their SCBA when they do outside ventilation. Hopefully, after seeing this presentation, you'll understand how important that is. We also looked at fire ground exposures to particulate and VOCs, and we found that those levels could be well above background. Of course, it really depends on the wind direction, atmospheric conditions, and then also the age of your apparatus and if you're running them while during the response, so the diesel exhaust contribution. We also looked at exposures during overhaul. Um, as well as other researchers, we found PAHs and benzene can exceed short-term exposure limits during overhaul. We also looked at dermal exposure to PAHs. Larry mentioned some of the work, some of the early work that NIOSH did uh, showing that the neck was exposed. In this particular study, this is still the IFSI study, so a coordinated attack of a residential structure, we found much higher levels of exposure on the hands. And part of the reason we, we believe we found this uh, versus our, our initial study in 2010 is that this was you know, realistic firefighter uh, behavior. I mean, they were you guys were crawling around on your hands and knees using water and then also during the doffing, some of it might have transferred to the hands. The necks were still exposed, however, especially when you look at the upper ranges of exposure, we saw rather high levels on the neck for attack and search. And of course, lower levels for overhaul and outside vent, but still, we did measure exposures even for those positions. So the absorption route, really we're, we're focused on two routes of absorption for firefighting, inhalation and dermal absorption. Now inhalation is still the most important route of exposure. This is the most direct way that these compounds can get into your body. So it's absolutely critical that SCBA is used, and I put it in the hot zone, because it's not just, it shouldn't just be used inside the structure in my opinion, but even just outside the structure if you're doing outside ventilation or you know, possibly during size up. And then as Larry mentioned, the combustion particles are rather small. I put in the respirable size range, probably even many of them are submicron. And particles in that size range are able to penetrate into the lower respiratory system. And this is important because your clearance mechanisms are much less effective in the lower respiratory lungs and you can get inflammation as well as rapid absorption of those compounds into your bloodstream. Now, as inhalation exposure is better controlled, a dermal absorption becomes more important. It, be, it may even become the most important route of exposure if you're controlling the inhalation route. And we know from other, some other studies that PAHs that deposit on the skin will be absorbed through the skin. So if you take uh, coal tar, apply it to the skin, they, another study was able to show that they could find 20 to 56% of it inside your body within about six hours. And that there was faster absorption for thinner skin. So a good example of the differences in absorption by skin thickness is uh, looking at hydrocortisone. And if you look at the jaw angle, which is of course an extension of the neck, uh, 
It's about 93 times more absorptive than the plantar foot arch, which is the thickest part of the skin. And then, of course, this is the, uh, the picture of the FAST study where you see a lot of the exposure happening on the neck. Now, some VOCs, which VOCs will be primarily in vapor form during firefighting, those can actually be absorbed directly through the skin. So it's not necessarily that they have to deposit. They could actually be absorbed uh, in vapor form through the skin or condense on the skin and then be absorbed. And there's been some studies that have shown up to 1% of benzene vapor can be absorbed. Now that sounds like a small amount, right? But I just talked about how enormous the concentrations of benzene are during firefighting. And then, if, then the absorption will vary by skin temperature, sweat, and humidity. And there's one animal study where they actually took benzene, applied it to the skin of a monkey, and they were able to measure it in the monkey's breath within 30 minutes, which is about the same time that we have measured benzene in the breath in firefighters. Now, as I mentioned, the most important part of this exposure pathway is the dose, what actually is absorbed into the body. You can be standing on a, on a pool of chemicals, but if it doesn't get into your body, it's not a hazard per se. So there have been a couple studies that have found elevated levels of benzene and PAHs in firefighters' bodies after firefighting. There's also been some studies that have found elevated levels of flame retardants in firefighters' blood and urine compared to the general population. For all of these studies, inhalation and dermal absorption are possible. Um, but I also want to note that ingestion is possible. Okay, so we focus so much on inhalation and dermal absorption. But if your, your hands are contaminated and you're at rehab and you're eating, you can also ingest some of these chemicals. And I just showed this, uh, this figure here which shows benzene and breath, uh, where we measured it before firefighting, after, so post firefighting, and then six hours later. And for the most part, we see an increase in benzene and breath. And these were firefighters who wore SCBA the entire exercise. So the inhalation route should have been well controlled. So what can be done? I feel like I presented a lot of like bad news, but I promise you there are some simple things that can be done to reduce your exposures. Obviously the first one is wear SCBA. You should wear it during the, the response, but also during overhaul. Outside ventilation is important too. I say establish hazard zones. I know it's kind of a new way to think, but in hazmat, this way it's the way it has been done. Um, so if you have a hot zone and firefighters know SCBA in the hot zone, that, that makes managing the response much easier. Set up command upwind if possible. That will certainly lessen the exposure for the, the command personnel. Rehab away from used gear because of the off-gassing. Transport contaminated gear <clears throat> in an encapsulated bag. And then if you have diesel exhaust filtration on your apparatus, that'll help at the fire scene. And if you have capture systems in your station, it's important to use it there as well. To reduce dermal exposure. And this is sort of a new one for me, but I think it's really important that firefighters remove their gear to mini minimize the cross contamination. And IFSI has done some recent videos uh, to show the difference, I don't have the videos here, but this is a picture, of just being careful at removing your hood, what a difference that makes, left versus right. And the same thing with the hands. If somebody else removes your gloves, and I know that's not always practical, it makes a tremendous difference on how much soot gets on the hands. But even if you get soot on your skin, there is an opportunity to remove it. Wash your skin with soap and water if you have that available. If not, use skin cleansing wipes. It's important to decontaminate and launder the turnout gear, including hoods and, and gloves. And then it's important to shower as soon as possible. The last one I put, uh, these new barrier hoods, the particle blocking hoods. I put some question marks there because I think we do need more research. Theoretically, those should reduce exposure to particulate, but we really need to see the science behind it. So how effective are some of these control interventions? We did have an opportunity to look at some different types of gross on-scene decon, an air-based method that used a modified uh, electric leaf blower, a dry brush, just 
brushing off the gear. The advantage of those two methods, obviously, is the gear doesn't get wet. And then a wet soap decon, where it's essentially wet decon, but we added a, uh, a pump sprayer that was filled with a soapy water mixture, and we scrubbed, and then we rinsed. Each of these took about two to three minutes to do. And what we found is that the wet soap decon method was substantially more effective than the, than the dry decon methods, where we were able to show about an 85% reduction in pH contamination on the surface of the gear. How about the skin cleansing wipes? We actually had an opportunity to look at these as well. So we sampled half the neck for PAHs, had firefighters clean their entire neck, and then we sampled the other half of the neck. It's not a perfect study design, but it was a way to at least get some initial numbers on this. And we found about a 54% reduction in PAH exposure just by using these, these were just commercial baby wipes, very inexpensive. We've since looked at some of the uh, wipes that are specifically made for firefighters, and we're currently analyzing some of that data as well. So some ongoing work listed here. Um, just to let you know, we are looking at analyzing air and surface samples for flame retardants and dioxins. So not just, I've talked a lot about pHs and benzene, but we're also concerned about those chemicals. We're looking at what's got, what for the IFSI study, what actually got into the body. We're looking at the effects of job assignment and attack tactic. So if you do transitional attack, for example, does that lessen your exposure? We're exploring exposures among instructors. We're evaluating the protection of turnout gear, including barrier hoods as well as regular Nomex hoods, after repeated exposure and laundering. So if you're a progressive fire department, you may have started laundering your gear after every fire response, and that's great. But that might mean gear that used to get washed or laundered two times a year is now being laundered 10 times a year or more. So how does that affect the protective properties of the gear? We're studying that right now with IFSI. We're actually going to have an opportunity to evaluate the IAFF N4's exposure module. So this is a great tool that firefighters can use. It's available now to track your exposures. It's your personal exposure record. What we want to do is actually combine that with quantitative exposure monitoring to, to essentially validate the exposure tracking app to put real numbers behind it. And then ultimately we want to develop an evidence-based job exposure matrix. This is what epidemiologists use to do really robust dose response relationship analysis. And it's what's, what is lacking right now in the fire service. So I just want to acknowledge that this research requires an army of researchers from all over the country it also requires funding, um, so I have the funding agencies up here, and we can't do it without firefighters like you who are in the audience. So I thank you for your service and for helping with studies. And that's all I have, and I thank you. There's uh, URLs here for more information if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fent. As you can see, you know, you better, hopefully you have a better understanding of why the preventive methods that have been being published and, and, and educate to all our firefighters why, that is, why we need to do that because of the exposures, the size of the particulates, and how that's are spread throughout our apparatus and back to our fire stations, and unfortunately sometimes uh, back to our homes. <clears throat> Now I want to take a different route and talk a little bit about advanced treatment. <clears throat> Scientific advances have, uh, have broadened our understanding of how cancer forms and grows, you know, on the molecular level. Um, this deeper knowledge has ushered in really a, a new era of precision cancer treatment, uh, where the personalized treatments target the abnormalities that may, may be found in each tumor's DNA profile. This genomic tumor testing is, is a tool uh, to assist oncologists and treating physicians in prescribing those targeted, ter uh, targeted treatments ther and therapies to control that abnormal cell growth and the rapid uncontrolled cell spread, which is the cancer. GPS, or genomic proteomic spectrometry, is a more progressive approach 
that matches results uh, with the treatments. As I said earlier, we, we, when we had our uh, initial cancer summit, we, uh, the general president wanted to uh, reach out out of the box a little bit, uh, take a step forward, what can be done for firefighters than the normal treatment? What can we do to hopefully help put these cancers in remissions without waiting years down the road? And that ended up with a uh, working relationship uh, with Nant Health. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce Dr. William Flood. Uh, Dr. Flood's the chief medical officer at NanHealth, and he was named one of the best doctors in America. Uh, Dr. Flood is a member of the Thoracic Committee and the Head and Neck Committee of the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, one of the largest clinical trial research organizations in the United States. He's also a participating member of the Radiation Therapy Oncology Group, which is the world's largest radiation treatment group. Uh, Dr. Flood's a faculty member was a faculty member at Penn State College of Medicine, the Hershey Medical Center, uh, where he cared for patients with aerodigestive di malignancy. Uh, I'd like to introduce and welcome uh, Dr. William Flood. <laughs> I have to use the enter button. Well, thank you very much uh, for your uh, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, and thank you for uh, having myself and uh, my colleagues from Nant Health uh, here uh, to uh, uh, both to speak to you at meetings like this, but also to uh, present uh, to you uh, on a more individual level more details about our GPS cancer. Uh, in, in his introduction uh, for today, Larry mentioned that we're you know, talking about new improvements in uh, the treatment of cancer. And uh, I can tell you that on the treatment side of cancer, the news is good. Uh, uh, I think it was about five or six years ago that the um, death rate or the, the mortality rate associated with cancer uh, actually peaked and turned so that more people are surviving uh, cancer uh, than uh, ever have before. And I think that that is a function of two things. Um, one is that we do have improved treatments. And I'm going to talk about some of those improved treatments in a little more detail, but still not too much detail in, in a few minutes. Probably the biggest effect on what's improved our survival rates on um, the curability of cancer and survival of cancer is the fact that we are now finding cancers in earlier stages than we did in the past. And that's um, typically through um, a process called screening. Um, you know, uh, the illnesses that we typically think about that we as uh, adults should undergo routine screening for uh, include breast cancer in um, uh, women uh, undergoing mammography and self-exam. Um, all people, men or women, undergoing colonoscopy on a regular basis, typically at the age of 50, unless we have earlier risk factors. Um, for the men in the audience, um, there's some debate about whether prostate cancer screening improves outcome or just finds it earlier. Um, but nonetheless, um, people are doing better. So there's a real importance and probably much more impact in screening and finding cancers early. To me, one of the most important things about the research that uh, Dr. Fent just described to you is, is identifying or proving that um, you as firefighters are at increased risk so that we determine what screening methods are warranted for you or whether earlier screening is appropriate or the like, and also having society support that uh, approach as part of your health design uh, and benefits and the like. Uh, and I think that's a real value of, of the work that, that Dr. Fence described to, to all of you today. Obviously, though, the bigger reason why people can be uh, uh, cured of cancer or not die from cancer is not getting it to begin, begin with. And that's to me, the real take-home message from uh, the work that uh, uh, was described earlier, uh, the prevention that you can do on scene or after scene uh, is really impressive. Uh, I've had the pleasure of, of now hearing you speak, but also uh, your colleagues from the University of Arizona did a really beautiful discussion uh, on um, some of the prevention uh, interventions uh, when I spoke at the Mullane Symposium last year. And uh, to me, as neither a firefighter uh, nor a prevention uh, guru, um, the understanding, having better understanding about the risk and also the success and the value of those interventions is, is helpful and eye-opening. So back to uh, the topic that Larry assigned to me, and, and that was the, the idea of treatment. Um, again, the, the good news is that treatment is better. And, and the reason why the treatment is better 
and for the most part, it is because we understand cancers better. Um, we can now uh, understand the actual biology of what happens inside a cancer cell much better than we could before. And, and we do that typically by looking at the molecules that drive the behavior of a cell. Um, the problem with those molecules that drive the behavior of the cell is that they are frequently targets of the very chemicals that you just saw uh, in the earlier discussion. Um, DNA, which is the, the molecule that's our blueprint of how our cells um, develop and grow and behave, is a target of benzene, of uh, the PAH drugs, of the dioxins, et cetera. Um, uh, asbestos, which is a risk factor of mesothelioma, um, gets into the lungs, causes chronic inflammation, and the chemicals created from that inflammation in turn attack DNA, distort the DNA. And so what causes cancer are exposures to these uh, DNA damaging agents that change the normal proteins that make our cells grow. You may remember from biology that DNA is the blueprint, but a, all of our cells don't use the same part of the blueprint. Obviously a cell that contributes to our fingernail uh, isn't the same as a cell on our tongue. And the reason why we can use the same blueprint but have a fingernail cell or a tongue cell or a kidney cell is because not all the DNA is used, but just part of it for each cell. And the part that's used is coded in what's called RNA. That's the message from um, the blueprint that then gets made into a protein. So it's the protein that really drives how our cells behave. And when we're trying to understand the biology of a cancer cell, the easiest thing to do, if we could do it, would simply be able to analyze every protein that exists in our cells. Technologically, we can't do that. And so for the most part, what we do is we just try to measure the DNA because it's a very easy test for lab folks to do. You may remember in the late 2000s, there was all this excitement about the Human Genome Project. The Human Genome Project to figure out what all the uh, billions and billions of base pairs in our DNA, what's the right structure, what's the right sequence of these codes um, took many years and billions of dollars. A test that is sent to us now to do a genome for a single tumor is done in three days. And so the technology that has um, allowed us to understand cancer care has also led to better treatments. So we now know that for many of these mutations that occur in our DNA, we can develop drugs that specifically target the mutated proteins and turn them off. So um, a cell that has a mutation in gene X, where that new protein X is just like a gas pedal driving the cell to grow and behave abnormally and, and invade tissues, as Larry discussed. When we have a new drug that fits into that mutated protein and just fits like a lock, a key into a lock, turns it off, and we can lead to better uh, 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 turning off the cancer functionality. You also, I'm sure, in the context of just watching TV, have heard a lot about the new strides in immunotherapy. Um, it's, it's hard for me to think of a, a single day on TV now where I don't see an ad uh, for uh, certain drugs that help turn on our immune system to recognize the cancer. And so these improved treatments are there because you have better understanding of the biology and our drug companies and our scientists are able to apply that in a way to make better treatments. The real problem with that though is that better treatment by itself um, isn't always enough. You know, when we identify a better treatment, uh, we take new treatment A and we want to compare it to old treatment B. And so we take 100 patients that we've lumped together because they have cancer of the lung, or cancer of the colon, or they have cancer of the right big toe. I don't, I don't know what that is, but they have that same type of cancer. And we also say, gee, how far has the cancer spread? And we lump those people together, and we're assuming that those 100 people with that same type of cancer and that same kind of pattern of spread are gonna behave the same way. And so we give the first 50 drug A, the new drug, and we give the other 
50, drug B, the older therapy. We want to see if A is better than B. The problem is that we can lump people together all we want, but our tumors are still individual. So if I did that test where I compared drug A to drug B, and in the 50 people who uh, got drug A, their response rate was 25 out of 50 had their tumor shrink, and the response rate in the, the older drug group was only 10 out of 50, it's easy for us to say that drug A is better than drug B over 100 people. The problem for me as a physician when I'm seeing a patient is for the patient who's in front of me in the room today, I don't know if they're one of the patients that would have done better with drug A or would have done better with drug B. And that's where the idea that Larry was talking about earlier, where we look at the tumor and we try to identify individual information about the tumor allows us not to just lump patients together to say drug A is better than drug B, but then can allow us to split patients apart and say, in general, drug A is better than drug B, but for you, drug A or drug B is the right answer for sure. Instead of it being a 50% chance of response or a 10% chance of response, your chance of response is much higher with the right drug because we know about your cancer. And that's a critical issue here, uh, particularly for this audience. We just heard for the, the last uh, hour or so about how unfortunately the, the occupation that we're all grateful that you've taken on can unfortunately put you at increased risk for cancer. Um, and you know, as Dr. Fan already showed, that risk can be anywhere from nine to 14% increased risk of cancer compared to the normal people. So if we can help your physicians uh, treat your members that have cancer um, with more optimal therapy, we're really grateful to have that chance. And this is that sad statistic. I told you that our drugs are better for treating cancer in general, but they still don't work for enough people. Um, if I take that, like I said, 100 people and give them drug A, it doesn't work for 95% of the people all the time. And the numbers, unfortunately, are more like 25% of the time it works. Um, and so if you're in the room in front of me and I can give drug A, drug B, drug C, or drug D, and all of them work in 20 to 25 percent of the people, I'd rather be able to know something more about your tumor that says I should start with drug C first than just make it a coin flip to choose between drug A, B, C, or D. And so that's the goal of the testing that, that we're going to talk about. It's the idea that by looking at the genes, the RNA, and the proteins in a tumor, we can better identify treatment not for 100 patients, but for that patient that's standing right in front of me. Um, Dr. Soon Shang, uh, who uh, uh, Larry referred to earlier, um, has been involved in uh, the care of cancer patients for many years. Initially as a surgeon, um, he uh, was a uh, pancreas cancer and pancreas transplant surgeon for many years at UCLA. Uh, but as part of his different research opportunities while a professor there, he also got involved in uh, novel therapeutics, and he developed a drug that subsequently became a new standard of care in the treatment of breast cancer. Um, from developing that drug, he realized that it had this improved effect for patients, but what he really wanted to understand was who are the right patients to get this drug at the right time. And that's what led him to develop what we call the GPS cancer test. And the GPS cancer test looks at three different components uh, of a cancer cell and tries to put it, all this information together into one report that can go to a treating physician to guide uh, therapy. First, we look at the entire genome of the cancer cell. Um, that is about six feet of DNA that we try to look at, and we, it can look at in, this, in the space of three days. Um, there are other tests in this space that um, will also do molecular testing. The vast majority, though, don't look at six feet of DNA. They look at one-tenth of an inch or one inch of the DNA. Uh, on the other hand, we look at all six feet. More importantly, though, than how many genes we look at is the comparison we make. Uh, 
Dr. Fenn alluded earlier to that, if I'm comparing, if I want to figure out if firefighters have an increased risk of cancer, I have to know what I'm comparing it to. And so I, he said, we can try to compare you to the general population. Well, most of the time when we compare the tumor's DNA structure or its DNA sequence, most people or most companies compare it to some universal normal genome. It was determined by people from all over the world who said, this is what every human being looks like. Well, that's not the case. I don't know who that person is, but I'm sure his mom and dad weren't mine. And so there's no doubt that my normal DNA is different from that person's DNA. So there's no way my tumor will look like that person's normal genome. And the, the hazard or the problem there is that too many, too often, the mutations that are identified by comparing to someone else are, are incorrect. So up to uh, a third or two thirds of the time, a test that says there's a mutation at this spot or that spot, it's not a real mutation. It's a mutation just because the patient who had the tumor has a different set of parents than the patient, they, the person we compared them to. We avoid that one third or two thirds error rate by always doing a comparison between the patient's tumor and the patient themselves. And that's critical in making sure that we're identifying the best targeted treatment, or when we're looking at these drugs that turn on the immune system, identifying the best patients who will respond to immunotherapy. Second, we don't just look at the DNA of the cancer cell, we also look at the RNA, because not every gene in a cell is turned on all the time. You know, how does our cell that makes our nail, why isn't it a kidney cell? Well, it's because part of the genes are turned on and part of the genes are turned off. The same thing is true in a cancer cell. So we may detect a mutation, but it doesn't mean it's turned on. And if you're gonna target a mutation with a drug, it better be one that's turned on. Otherwise, you're taking the drug and having the side effects but there's no chance for it to benefit. So in addition to looking at the 20,000 genes across the six feet of DNA, we also look at the 200,000 pieces of RNA that have end up coding for the proteins in our cells. So for those reasons, when we're talking about what we call precision medicine, we think our test is truly the most precise. With good DNA information, with good RNA information, we can identify targeted therapies or immunotherapies for probably 10 to 15 or 10 to 20 percent of patients that probably offer a better outcome than that's associated with standard chemotherapy or, or picking chemotherapies just by going down a list. That's still not helping the other 80 percent of patients that really will just get benefit from chemotherapy. So to add to that, we look at selected proteins through what's called mass spectrometry. That's the S in our GPS test. By looking at those selected proteins, we're able to not just give advice on these targeted or immunotherapies, we're now able to give the doctor direction on which chemotherapy drugs may be more likely or less likely to help the patient. And so our goal is never to replace your physician. Our goal is to give the physician more information so that the physician can provide better treatment for that person who's in front of them. Um, the way that the uh, National Cancer Institute and the National Academy of Science put it is trying to improve uh, and assure that the right patient is getting the right treatment at the right time and doing it based on more than how 100 patients versus 100 patients do, but looking at the patient who's in front of us and saying, this is the best treatment for you because I know which one you are out of those 100 or the other 100 patients. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you again for having us. Uh, and more importantly, I want to thank you very much for the job that you do. Uh, again, all of us at Nant Health are grateful for this opportunity uh, to help your membership. Uh, you've taken on a job that's uh, at risk for cancer, and we're eager for the opportunity to help any of you that are unfortunately are diagnosed with that illness to get the best possible treatment at the right time.
Thank you. Before we go into questions, you know, we can conclude out of the talks here that really what we're looking at is three legs. We're looking at their occupation. You know, the occupation being, can we change our cultural behavior? Can we, how do we clean our gear? What are we doing on the fire ground differently? How can we reduce our risk to exposures? The second leg is medical. As part of this thing is to make sure we have our annual medical exams. And we try to have some kind of fitness, wellness fitness program within our fire departments. And the third leg, if you heard it, the third leg is what can we do as our own selves? Just recently, I believe the American Cancer Society said almost, uh, uh, I think it was just a couple months ago, approximately 30% of cancers can be, provide, can be prevented just by, just by self, self uh, changing your, your self, um, um, uh, no smoking, you know, better diet, uh, uh, moderation of alcohol. So it's, it's the, our own fitness, our own wellness factors involved with that, our own decisions that we make in life. So as a firefighter, we have to look at all three of those things. It's a three-legged stool. We just can't rely on, okay, let's, I want my turnout gear cleaned. We do have to take the time to have our medical exams, and we do have to take the time to change our individual risk factors of what we're doing there. So with that, we'll open up uh, uh, for questions. Um, I'm gonna ask the first question. Uh, Dr. Fent, um, is there any research done on uh, carcinogens in boots that uh, is being done at FC? Is this on? Uh, should, is that on? Can, is this on? Everybody yep. hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware, unfortunately, I'm not aware of any research that's looked at the boots. Um, with some of the recent work we have with IFSI, we are looking at the helmets, we, including the helmet liners. Um, we're trying to trace the particulate, the soot, um, and this, this pertains to the, the study looking at what happens to PPE if you launder it repeatedly. Um, we're trying to trace how the particulate gets into the gear. Um, and so we are looking at some of those interface regions and things like that, but, the, but not the boots. I mean, that's certainly an area. And that's important because, as I mentioned during my talk, um, obviously, uh, you know, a lot of these contaminants can be tr tracked back to the apparatus, back to your station. So if you still have those boots on, or if you wear them back home, um, certainly some of those contaminants can be tracked back. Uh, for Dr. Flood, uh, the, uh, one quick question. Uh, when you look at your, at your results of the DNA, RNA of the GPS, um, do you get a report back? How does the report indicate compared to the various drugs that are out there in existence? Well, what we provide to um, the physician in the reporting um, is, a, is a kind of lengthy report. It can be anywhere from uh, 18 to 30 pages long. But we summarize those results on the front uh, of the front page of the report by essentially highlighting those drugs that we think are more likely to be effective for that patient's tumor based on the biology and also downplaying or highlighting the drugs that we think are less likely to be effective. And at the same time, we have a summary associated with each of those drugs about what was the molecular evidence that says we think this drug is more likely to help, we think this drug is less likely to help. And we will do that um, both for drugs that are currently FDA approved and are considered standard of care drugs, but also highlight um, as possible if there are any trials that are open across the country that are looking at novel drugs or uh, you know, sci uh, new drugs that haven't yet been approved that particularly target the abnormalities that we found. So uh, if the physician looks at that first page, the face sheet, they're gonna get that data in a brief summary but then in the subsequent pages, they can get, go into much more detail about why we made each of those suggestions. In the um, uh, future, we're, we're in the process right now of actually building a um, online portal that will allow the um, molecular results that we identify from our test to be overlapped with all the standards of care and research trials that are underway uh, in the United States so that it's much more real time 
uh, and it's much more comprehensive, and it's right available at the physician's fingertips. Not there yet. Um, that's what keeps me busy. Um, but uh, our our 18 to 30 page report uh, is comprehensive. More importantly, um, myself, our other physicians, and our uh, nursing support staff are always available to talk to patients or to talk to physicians about the data we find and. and uh, to help understand it, and that's not a small issue. You know, one of the questions came up in our situation yesterday about physician adoption of this type of technology. This technology didn't exist when I was in medical school. Half the genes we talk about as being associated with cancer now, we just gave them names, but we didn't know what they did when I was in medical school. Now, that may just mean I'm really, really old. Okay, I'm not gonna disagree with that. I have no hair, I'm with you. but. It really is highlighting the idea that our technology um, has outstripped our training as physicians. And so we want to provide this report back to the physicians and provide the personal support so that the oncologists feel comfortable introducing something that they weren't trained on into their, their daily practice now. Audience, questions, please step up to the microphone. Please step up to the microphone. <laughs> there's a lot of there's been a lot of research so So um with regard to the exposures or with regard to the cancer? So the cancer, the risk of cancer, um, there's been a number of studies done in other countries uh, recently that, that were well-powered um, that have found some of the same cancers that the NIOSH study found. None of those studies that have been done found all the same cancers that NIOSH found that were statistically significant. And some of that could be, even though those were well-powered studies, they still may not have enough sufficient power to detect some of those increased risks of cancer. It could also be due to differences, as you mentioned, difference in, in turnout gear, the way they battle fires, uh, the furnishings. You know, for example, flame retardants may not be used in every country. Um, not saying that flame retardants are, are the sole cause of cancer, but... Um, and so we don't really know why there are those differences, but we would certainly expect some differences just because of geographic, uh, you know, the differences in geographic location and practices. Right. So that is, that's something we're certainly interested in looking at. Um, we've, we've got a relationship with uh, a fire de the fire department, I forget what it's called, um, out of the Netherlands, where they actually sent, when we were doing the PPE study uh, with Illinois Fire Service Institute, they sent us one of the European helmets, and we put it on the mannequins that we were using for that study just to kind of get some pilot data. Um, I will tell you that visually, we still saw a lot of penetration around the neck region for those, um, those helmets, and the, the hood was built into the helmet. Um, and so I, I think there needs to be more research looking at those helmets. You know, it's, they're different. For, they're certainly different than the American helmets, but to, you know, it's, it would be hard to say right now whether they're better in terms of preventing dermal exposure. You know, one of the issues with, with the turnout gear, when you look at what drove our turnout gear and what's our turnout gear designed to do, it's to resist the heat. It's the dermal protective performance, it's the total heat loss. So now with the, with the, with the uh, uh, penetration of, of um, our gear, with the particulates <laughs> going through it and the products of combustion going through it through the openings, or actually through the, you know, the three layers themselves, um, the question now becomes, well, how, how do we, or how does the industry um, solve this problem? 
And that's where, and that's where the crossroads where the, where the manufacturers are at now. Again, our gear was designed you know, for, for thermal protection. And now we're asking our gear to give us some particulate protection. So that raises other concerns. You know, other concerns that have to be addressed is um, how will that impact the total heat loss? You know, the total heat loss is the heat that can be released through our gear to keep our body core temperatures, you know, constant, consistent. And we release that so we don't overheat because the body's taking a physiological beating in itself, not just from physically, the physical aspect of breathing hard and, and so forth, but to what's happening uh, within our bodies uh, that, you know, that we're not aware of. You know, how are the t kidneys being affected? Um, how's the, uh, the, the, we know that the blood thickens uh, during the firefight. You know, we know that the heart rate goes up, um, the plasma is reduced. So though all those things impact the human body. So when you start making changes in gear, all of that has to be looked at also. So, you know, we maintain the physiological uh, balance uh, with the gear for, you know, between protection and what's it doing to our bodies. So that's research that's still going. So, uh, David Lindsay, Local 58, Dallas, Texas. Uh, we have a presumptive law in Texas, and uh, I've been working with our guys in our association for about, about the last five years. Uh, we just came across uh, an instance this last week, and I wanted to kind of get your uh, uh, take on it. Uh, our presumptive law says that they have to normally respond to firefighting activities and been a member for five years. Uh, we just had a guy that came down with testicular cancer, and he only has two years on. Um, do you think that's outside the norm, or, or is that something that we're going to have to really have a hard time fighting, or, or uh, is, I mean, is an exposure an exposure? So that's, and maybe you can chime in here too. I don't know. That, that's a very good question. Very good question. So you know, most cancers have long latency periods, meaning that you're exposed, and then there's a period of time. You know, if we look at chemical exposure, there's a period of time before you develop cancer, before it is diagnosed. It's usually 10, 20 years, sometimes longer. But testicular cancer is unique because testicular cancer typically attacks younger men, which would seem to indicate that either they're exposed at young ages to something that causes the cancer or there's some genetic um, abnormality, or it has a much shorter latency period. And I don't know the answer to that, except to say that it's, pr it's probably something to explore in depth. Uh, you know, if you had said some other type of cancer, I would say that it probably wasn't occupationally related. But for testicular cancer, there could still be a link, um, but I can't say definitively. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, uh, Adam Van Gerpen, uh, Los Angeles City Local 112. Um, I, I have two questions. That this this uh, last gentleman's question just uh, brought up another issue. Um, we have heard that there's been uh, studies saying that there is an increase in testicular cancer because of the benzenes that collect on our turnout pants uh, as they're sitting on the apparatus floor. So we were in LA City. We're pretty fortunate. We have the Plymo vents that collect it, but we still have a, a you know everybody still keeps our turnouts outside of the uh, uh, apparatus. So there's some thought of putting them inside the apparatus so that you're not collecting those benzenes on the, uh, you know, in the, in the crotch area of the turnouts. But, then, but now if, if there is anything, uh, you know, you could have it inside the cab. So I don't know if there's been any studies on, uh, on that because we've, we've heard, we hear different things from different people. So um, I guess, with regard to testicular cancer in firefighting, so some of the early studies seem to suggest that there was an increased risk in, the, in U.S. firefighters. When NIOSH did the much larger study, that was not found to be an increased risk for testicular cancer. And it was a much, you know, much more well-powered, larger study. Um, so, you know, perhaps firefighting isn't associated with testicular cancer, or perhaps there were specific, I guess, procedures taking place at those departments, those earlier studies, that increase the risk for those firefighters. Testicular cancer is not an extremely common type of cancer, um, and so it makes it hard when you do epidemiology studies. But, so that, there's part one. Part two was how, I guess, for your station gear, right? How do you store it? Was that the question? 
uh, just storing it, you know, ready to respond. So there's, okay. we, you know, some people say to store it inside, and we, but I mean, I, almost every fire station you go into, they're gonna be at nighttime. They're gonna be sitting outside, ready to respond. Okay. And I, you know, I'm not aware of any uh, research that's really looked at contamination, especially in the crotch area. Um, we did uh, back in 2010. We did the big dermal exposure study that Larry had mentioned. And we actually did some, uh, some scrotal wipes, or we didn't do it, the firefighters did it themselves. Um, but in any case, we didn't find really any evidence of exposure after firefighting in the crotch area. Um, I think if there is exposure happening, you know, first of all, the, the scrotum is probably about the thinnest skin on the body, other than the eyelids. So if you did have exposure, it would be absorbed pretty rapidly, I think. Um, so we may have just missed, missed it. Um, but, so I guess the question is, are you being exposed? I think if the exposure is happening, a lot of it is because of the cross transfer. So your hands are dirty, and then you go to the bathroom. I don't know about the turnout, or the uh, station clothing per se, as being a source. But, you know, it's certainly something that could be explored further. Okay, and then uh, my second question, the original one came with the, uh, you mentioned some of the, uh, the wipes. And in the, in, the, in the PowerPoint presentation there, you said there's been a 54% reduction in the, the, um, the hydrocarbons uh, by using those wipes. But you said that there's, um, so are, is there additional studies being done on that? And then, like, as far as the, the over-the-counter ones and then the, the rescue wipes that are specifically made for uh, firefighters and, you know, as so, far as, I know there's a difference in the chemical compounds and this kind uses, uh, um, you know, diff different uh, components in there. Right. So. so we did look at, in the last study, when we were looking at training fires, we explored a couple of the wipes that are specific, specifically made for the fire service. Uh, and, and we tested those, we have the data, I haven't analyzed it and I haven't published on it, so I can't really give the results. Um, but to say that they are effective, I can say that they are effective. Okay. Um, the baby wipes are also effective, but they're not 100% effective. N none of them are, okay? So it's important to use them after firefighting if you don't have access to soap and water, but it's also really important to shower as quickly as possible. And then as far as the ingredients, I'll just tell you my personal opinion. My personal opinion is that for an, a wipe to be effective at removing contamination, it needs to have a good surfactant. It needs to have a surfactant. For firefighters, I think it needs to be a large size and it needs to be durable. And if you have those properties, I think it will do a good job at removing contamination. Um, as far as the natural ingredients are concerned, and you know, there's all this marketing around that, that is a really difficult question to answer because just like it, everything in commerce, there are so many different chemicals and compounds out there, and I cannot say one way or the other if one is more hazardous or less hazardous than another. But I would, in my opinion, those three properties are the most important for an effective wipe. Okay, thank you. While he's coming up to the mic, a, a, a question to throw out <clears throat> is um, on, the, on the PPE, on the gloves, gloves and the hoods, uh, when your research shows that uh, some of the flame retardants uh, are remaining in, in, in the hoods and the, the fact that the gloves ha are, are absorbing so much of the contaminants, um, is it feasible or is it the right thing to do is to have disposable hoods or throw, get rid of the hoods and get rid of gloves after a major serious fire? I know that's a tough question because it's <laughs> you got economics and, and gloves are expensive and, and what do we do there? But <laughs> um, So, uh, you know, so the, I guess we haven't published on that yet, all right? So the hoods, but what we did is we looked at hoods that had been worn for four fires and not laundered at all, and then hoods that had been worn for four, four fires and laundered after every fire. And by position, we compared the laundered hoods to the unlaundered. We assumed that the laundered hoods 
would really, our hypothesis is that we wouldn't find any contaminants in it. I mean, they looked really clean after being laundered. In some cases, they were very similar levels of the brominated flame retardants and the laundered hoods compared to the unlaundered. So something appears to be happening. And again, we have to do some additional work on this because it is a bit controversial. But I will say that there have been other studies that have looked at polyester fabric, and they found the same thing with, in terms of brominated flame retardant contamination and polyester fabric. It's another synthetic fabric. There appears to be something where the fabric is basically retaining those brominated compounds. And they, the brominated compounds and polyester, I don't know about Nomex, but polyester is, is fat-loving. So fat-loving compounds want to stick to it. Surfactants theoretically should remove those fat-soluble compounds, but for whatever reason, it doesn't appear to be working very well with the hoods. If you had a disposable hood or some, you know, disposable glove, obviously that kind of circumvents this whole problem. Um, but then you have the cost, mm -hmm. you know, aspect to this whole thing. And the other question is, just because we're finding brominated flame retardants in the hoods after laundering, doesn't necessarily mean that this is a, con a, a hazard, a concern in terms of toxicity. If, if laundering it with a pretty, pretty good detergent is not removing it, we're not sure is it, is it actually going to be absorbed through the skin then. I mean, is it really just attached to that fabric? Is it really a concern? So there's a lot of questions that still have to be answered as to what it really means in terms of your exposures. You know, there's been a lot of research and still going a cleaning, uh, cleaning validation uh, studies with the uh, NFPA Fire Research uh, Foundation, um, with the IFSI's uh, uh, research. The thing is, what's happening is, is it's, it's, like a, it's like peeling back an onion. As you start doing the research, it just opens up more questions and more issues and more concerns and more things to think about. And that's, and that, and that's, and that's where we're at. And that's where we're at. There's still a lot of questions to be answered and a lot of questions that come up every day in the research that no one really thought about before that it comes up. Brother. Hi, uh, Jim from Local 3105. This is for Dr. Flood. I was just wondering to take back to our local, uh, how, do, how do we tell them to initiate the process if they are cancer patients for GPS? Well, I think there's, there's two levels to that question. And what, what local do you say you're with? Okay, so, um, uh, you know, we, we started our relationship with the IAF in <clears throat> 2016, late 2016, early 2017, and so um, we have, uh, you know, kind of an upper level agreement with the, the mother organization, but then we have a number of um, executed agreements at the local or municipality level with a number of uh, uh, specific localities as well. So I, I think that there's two ways to approach this. One is the organizational method where um, we can talk or work with you or your other members of your lo local to um, look at formalizing support for GPS cancer as part of your benefits, whether it's part of an IAF trust in your area or whether you're insured by your municipality. Either way, our um, group uh, is, is happy to work locally to, to get that as a formal part of your um, benefits package. The other approach is just the more general approach, and this is really open to not just IAF members, but to all patients, um, that we have a general website, we have a general phone number where um, people can reach out to us uh, to get the information around GPS cancer testing, get it forwarded directly to the physician, or working with our nurses, we can identify physicians in that area we've already worked with who have ordered our test. I'd also add that um, for the IFF, we actually have a specific web page um, and, and process uh, to specifically help uh, members of the IAFF. Um, in the back, I'm going to point out uh, three of my colleagues, um, Russ Johnson, uh, Ian Donovan, and Mark Jackson. Uh, all three of those uh, folks work with um, uh, both the national and the local IAF groups um, to uh, facilitate either local agreements or can get you tied into the right people 
to make uh, the test happen on, on a person who just needs it. Um, so uh, we, we had a booth up the last few days. Uh, if after we're done here, you want to hunt me or the three of us down, we can give you a card and have that information for you. I'm sorry I don't have a slide with that uh, to present it. I, and that, that was my oversight. Brother. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, Steve LeClaire, uh, Local 385, Omaha, Nebraska. Um, it's kind of a general question, so whoever can answer it. I'm not even sure if I'm asking the right question. Um, I, I guess I'm kind of wondering, you know, we have pretty decent presumptive laws in the state of Nebraska. And uh, there, there's some overarching language that essentially covers pretty much any cancer that, that you may get. Um, what I'm curious about, are, are there certain, are there particular cancers that are more prevalent in certain regions of the country? We've experienced recently kind of a, what I would consider to be an uptick in, in lymphoma diagnoses. But I don't know, I don't know if that's in line with what's happening regionally or if it's out of line with what's happening regionally. And is that information available anywhere? Is that information even documented anywhere? Because uh, I'd like to have some empirical data that says, you know, lymphoma is actually very uncommon in this Midwestern region versus it's very common. And, you know, the, the, the downside of our presumptive law is that it is a rebuttable presumption. And I just don't want anybody being cute with it and saying, you know, this guy's got lymphoma and, yeah, it's unfortunate and he's a firefighter and he died, but guess what? That's just general population numbers. Okay. This for a second. When you ask this question, are you asking it that you've seen a, a sudden increase in lymphoma amongst your, your members? Yes, sir. Or just in the area? It, um, amongst, well, well, that's the thing is I don't know. Okay, all right. Uh, so four, let's so four, four diagnoses in the last six months. Okay. So um, uh, I'm going to practice epidemiology without a license now, and he'll correct me. So he'll probably start talking in seconds after I start. But... Um, what you can see, especially when you're talking about a shorter period, is um, something that looks like a spike that really isn't. And so um, four cases among your membership in a, in, a, in a brief period is worrisome. It's also not proof of either being associated with the cancer, with, with just being a firefighter, or proof that there's an increase in lymphoma in your general area. Now, um, one of the most interesting things about the area you're describing is that the University of Nebraska Cancer Center is actually one of the world's centers of lymphoma treatment. And so I would think that... And so, everybody's getting treatment there. Right, right. And, and that's a great thing. Judy Voss and, the, and that group are, are they're superb. Um, I would be surprised if they didn't have an epidemiology group um, that could address any trends in, in Nebraska, um, either through just looking at their overall cancer registry or by um, looking at any general um, data uh, around cancer that's, that's not specific in Nebraska but just national. I am personally not aware of any hotbeds of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, across the country. It, just from my background, uh, what I'm more familiar with are differences in treatment approaches to cancers based on geography rather than necessarily incidence uh, of cancer based on geography. Um, but at Lincoln, you have a, 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 a terrific resource specifically on lymphoma. Um, regarding causality, um, you know, I think that the data that, that Dr. Fenn has shown, you know, certainly suggests that, that there is a, a, a probable role for um, knowledge, for firefighting as a, as a occupation to be associated with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And with that, here's Dr. Fent. Uh, I thought, <laughs> you know, what you can look too is, 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 is each state has the statistic, cancer statistics uh, that they release, you know, every year. It breaks down, you know, the number of cancers and the type of cancers that occur within that state. So you can look up that information. You know, and, um, and, and I think that, you know, with the language, the way it is in, in the presumptive language, you know, it's... I mean, even if, even though it's a rebuttable presumption, it's it's going to be very difficult to overcome. I mean, somebody's going to have to be able to come in and say, with some degree of medical certainty, he did not get that because of firefighting. I mean, that's how strong the language is. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just kind of worried about as as we as we get more and more of these, you know, related, you know, um, you know, cancer cases. You know, obviously, it's terrible to say, but it's also a, a quite a liability on on local pension systems. Um, so we need to stop it before it gets to that point where they're precluded mm -hmm. from becoming a firefighter because of the cancer. But I'm just kind of 
you know, looking down the road and, and you know, if this, this causally related uh, argument starts to come up during the, rebu uh, during the, the rebuttal of presumption. Good point, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, Steve Smith, uh, F107. Uh, Dr. Uh, Fant, you uh, mentioned that the, the Nomex hoods are retaining uh, contaminant even after they're laundered. Have you looked at or do you know of a study that may have looked at the Nomex station gear and whether it's retaining these same contaminants um, once they're laundered? Because like my station, we don't wear the buttons ups, but we do wear Nomex pants um, and our gear goes on over it. So we're wearing those into a fire and even though it's protected by the, the structural gear, there's still that possibility for contaminants. So we're taking that and we're wearing that into uh, day rooms and kitchens. And sure. so I'm just curious if you've looked at that study or if you know of anything like that. No, uh, no. I'm glad you brought it up. And I mean, to be honest, I, when you, when firefighters bring these ideas up, it just, it starts the wheels in my head that, that these are areas that we need to look at. Um, I would expect that Nomex station gear might behave similarly to Nomex hoods in terms of the laundering effectiveness. Um, whether they're exposed the same, that might be different. Okay. Um, you know, I think a lot of the contaminants on the hoods might be, um, you know, I guess solid, either solid particulate or it's in vapor and it's condensing to the hoods. You may not see the same phenomenon with uh, gear that's worn under turnout gear. Okay. Um, and so those are, that's why you look at it. You know, that's, it's a good question. And it's certainly something that should be explored. I right, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Afternoon, uh, Brad Lindgren from Local 3105 as well. Two questions, uh, kind of looking for some recommendations perhaps. The first is on um, if there's a gold standard for cancer screenings with your yearly physicals, is there some kind of test that we should be doing or looking for? Uh, and then my second question is with the gear, you talked about how the VOCs will off gas on their own, we think after 15 to 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean for having the gear in the vehicle, you know, on your way back to the station? Does that mean those VOCs stay in the cab or they're gonna just dissipate and be gone. I, you know, I don't, I'm yeah. not sure how that works. Well, I'll, I'll field the first question if you want to, or the second question if you want to take the first. I'll do the. I'll do the I first question. Well, we'll do the first the question. First question. I know the answer to. Yeah, really. On, on, the, on the first question on the cancer screenings, uh, I know there's a lot of marketing for different types of cancer screenings, um, but it's but it's 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 not proven yet. So when we when we get asked the question on cancer screenings. We say follow what's within the Wellness Fitness Initiative and NFPA 1582, uh, which is following, uh, you know, the American Cancer Society and the United States of Preventive Task Force recommendations on, on cancer screenings. Because, you know, these other screenings, you may end up with, you know, false positives. You may be, um, uh, you know, whether insurance covers, your doctor says, well, I don't know anything about this type of test that's out there. Or if they do say, well, well, we're going to have to put you through some invasive testing, and that invas invasive testing uh, may do damage to your body when it was not necessary to do that. So that's the recommendation that we have on, um, uh, on the cancer screenings. The second one. Thank you. <laughs> so the second question about the VOCs. Uh, VOCs are extremely volatile. And so they'll evaporate within about, the, you know, most of them will evaporate within the fifth, first 15 to 30 minutes. If they're in your apparatus, they're just going to get caught up in the you know, circulation system and then they'll eventually dissipate. So they don't necessarily stick around uh, inside the apparatus or inside your station, if, you know, depending on you know, if you if you're, go back to your station quickly. The semi-volatiles, however, so like some PAHs, for example, are semi-volatile, which means they're much more persistent. They evaporate, but at a very slow rate and produce very small concentrations, that'll take a lot longer to dissipate. And so it's more of a long-term concern, the semi-volatiles. And nobody, to my knowledge, has really looked at that yet. You know, Becca, we'll take one more question, then we'll wrap it up. And while he's walking up, when I mentioned the NFPA 1582, you get the 2018 editions 
is the one you want to look at because there's a lot of differences between the previous edition and the, and the 2018 edition. Sir, last question. Dean Yager, F105. Uh, just wondering, uh, any of you, uh, what your take is on heat de uh, detoxification as far as saunas and the fire stations? Uh, we don't recommend uh, uh, saunas afterwards. The reason being is, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the body goes through a tremendous amount of, uh, of physiological changes um, you know, after strenuous events. And, and, that, and, the reason, and, and that's just the reason why the PSOB states that there's a 20, they'll allow up to 24 hours of a strenuous event uh, to accept that as a line of duty death because it takes the body time uh, to get back to, to normal. As you said earlier, uh, you know, we have talk of the blood thickens, uh, you've been, uh, uh, your body's stressed, it's, it's, the core temperature has probably increased a little bit. Um, so so you're, we look at it not just as, as a cancer detox, but what's going on physiologically. And what's the risk of heart attack and more damage to the body, whether it's renal failure, ki you know, kidney failure, uh, additional damage being conducted if you're coming out of a sun, out of a fire, um, going to the fire station, and then going into a hot atmosphere. You know, what's that doing to the body? So there hasn't been much, re you know, research on that to begin with as far as is it actually going to detox the body or not detox the body compared to uh, 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 control groups. Um, but our concern is, is the physiological of the whole body, you know, the cardiovascular system, et cetera, et cetera as opposed to just on cancer prevention. So we don't recommend uh, the saunas at this, at this time. Uh, with that, I want to thank everybody um, for taking the time and asking the questions. And I most certainly want to thank uh, everyone remotely that was watching uh, via the webinar. I uh, hope the information uh, is insightful and gives you a better understanding of uh, the changes that we want to do within the fire service. Um, Always feel free to contact us at the IFF Health and Safety Department. And uh, all we can say is uh, take care, have a good day, and uh, stay safe. Thank you.